What a wonderful reminder of the power of the name of Jesus. I speak Jesus over all the issues and all the difficulties in life because if I know Jesus, uh, there is power in his name. You know, a lot of times at Christmas, our thought is about a little helpless baby being born and swaddled and, and laid in a manger. We, we don't think enough about his eternality, his wisdom, his uh, might and his authority and his power, the fact that he's the king of kings. That's why we're in a study in these weeks in Isaiah 9-6, Isaiah's prophetic word about the coming Messiah, where he speaks of his names. And there are four descriptive names or titles um, that are given to Jesus. Those names help us unpack uh, his, his nature. They help us understand the priceless value of the gift that God has given when, when God became incarnate and chose to, to dwell among us. I love the way John describes it in the gospel bearing his name. John 1 and verse 1, he says, and the word became flesh. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God. Then down in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. You know, if you really ponder that for just a moment, it, it's overwhelming to think about the grace and humility that the Son of God would leave heaven, a place that is beyond our comprehension, and would leave heaven and come to a broken world and live among a, a broken and dirty people. He made his dwelling among us, John says. What does that mean? It means he lived near us. He didn't live on the other side of the tracks. He lived near us. He moved into our corrupt neighborhood to be with us. He saw our struggles, he saw our hopelessness, and, and he came to offer himself to us. So our primary text over these weeks has been Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Four names that remind us of our need and remind us of his sufficiency. Now I want to take a few minutes this morning. This is our third week. I want to go back over and, and review those first two names just to be sure that we're building a, a complete picture in, in our minds and our hearts. The first name was the name Wonderful Counselor, that Jesus is our Wonderful Counselor. Why is he a Wonderful Counselor? Well, first of all, he's a wonderful counselor because he knows us. He, he knows you personally, not, not just an acquaintance or knowing about you, but he knows you. He knows you completely. He knows all of your talents and gifts. He knows your sins and, and your weaknesses. He knows your history, your hidden hurts and, and, and dreams uh, that are, are, are lost. He knows all about you. We looked at uh, that, that first week and talking about Jesus knowing us, we looked at the 139th Psalm where David wrote these words, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path, my lying down, you're acquainted with all my ways, even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. It could be a frightening thing to realize that God knows everything about you, but think about the fact that David goes on in that 139th Psalm, after talking about God knowing all about us, he goes on and says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they are more than the sand of the seashore. Isn't that amazing? That God knows us and yet loves us that much. You know, in relationships we have with other people, Sometimes we hold back and we're not fully open and fully transparent because we're, we're worried, we, we fear rejection. And yet the scriptures tell us Jesus knows exactly who we are and he not only accepts us fully, he even takes great joy in us. Can you think about if you're a, a parent or a, a grandparent probably, parents don't do this anymore, but grandparents, you probably have more than just the pictures on your phone, you probably have some pictures in your wallet. And can I tell you this morning that as a child of God, God has a picture of you in his wallet. He takes great joy in you. He knows all about you. Not only does he know about you and know all about your past and, and your history, but he knows your future. He knows where you're going. He knows what you're going to face. He knows what is ahead of you, and he knows how to guide you through what is ahead. That's why he's a wonderful counselor. He not only knows you as a wonderful counselor, he also understands you. Jesus understands the, the challenges of living in a fallen world. 
In Hebrews 4, uh, the writer of Hebrews reminded us that Jesus is able to sympathize with us. And to sympathize means not just to understand how someone is feeling, but to share their feelings. Jesus is able to share what we go through. Why? Because he himself experienced the human condition. He lived in a human body just like we do, and he walked the same path that we are walking. You know, you think about all the things that we experience as, as human, the difficulties of pain and loneliness and temptation and betrayal and, and suffering and loss and heartache. Whatever of that you might experience, Jesus is able to say, I know how you feel. And he says, I know how you feel because he knows how you feel. And as a wonderful counselor, he can show you the way forward through any of those circumstances. You see, because Jesus understands you and me, he knows exactly what we need. And his counsel always works as long as we choose to obey and follow it. So he's a wonderful counselor because he knows us, because he understands us. He's a wonderful counselor because he's always available. And he encourages, to, encourages us to come to him and ask for help. In Matthew 11, he said, come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Learn from me. We learn from him, we learn from his counsel, and he gives us rest. We come to him for guidance and direction because he's a wonderful counselor. You know, people who have the gift of counseling uh, enjoy helping others. They enjoy seeing someone overcome difficulty and seeing their life changed and, and seeing them move forward in a new way. But the frustrating thing for people who counsel, they will tell you, is seeing someone who remains stagnant or stuck in the same spot. Most counselors have had to learn from hard experience. You can't change someone who doesn't want to change. You know, just going to a counselor doesn't change your life. What changes your life is taking good counsel and following it. What changes your life is hearing the counsel of the wonderful counselor and obeying what he says. So this morning I would ask you if you're in a place of difficulty where you need uh, some change in your life, have you heard the words of Jesus? Do you know the words of Jesus? Do you listen to him? Do you understand and do you follow his teaching? Well, the second name that we covered last week given to Jesus here in this Isaiah 9, 6 passage after wonderful counselor is the name Mighty God. You know, scripture is clear that Jesus is fully God. That means he has all the wisdom, all the power, all the might of the Father. He is infinitely good. He is full of grace and mercy. Any descriptor you would use of God the Father would also apply to Jesus. But you know, we often, when we think about the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we think about God the Father as the one who is strong or the one who is forceful. And we see that in Scripture over and over again in the Old Testament that's revealed. Um, when God dealt with Pharaoh and he applied, bought, brought his might to bear on Pharaoh to free the Israelites from slavery and oppression. Throughout the Old Testament, you see God displaying his might against the enemies of his people. But let's not forget that Jesus is God. And so the same uh, power and strength and ability God has is also in Jesus. In Colossians 1, Paul said, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. All things were made by him. Everything visible and invisible was made by him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's the kind of might that Jesus has that is available to you and me. You know, probably the most obvious visual uh, demonstration of the might of Jesus occurred in, in Matthew, where he demonstrated his might over the elements. You remember that in Matthew, down in verses 23 through 27, um, it, it's, it's recorded that he got into a boat with the disciples, going out across the Sea of Galilee, and while they were in the boat, Jesus lay down and went to sleep, and this huge storm arose, and, and the wind and the waves were beating against the boat, and the disciples were so afraid that they might lose their lives that they finally woke him up, and they said, Lord, save us. Jesus got up, he rebuked their little faith, and then he simply said to the winds and the waves to, to be still and to be calm. And what's interesting in that display of his might is the, the, the response of the disciples. When Jesus stilled the wind and the waves, they said to themselves, what sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? What sort of man is this? You know what they were saying? What have we gotten ourselves into? We've made a decision to follow this man, and, and, and not from a distance, in close proximity. Is he going to use that kind of power on us? And it frightened them to see the might 
that Jesus had. They had an up close and personal demonstration of what it means that Jesus is the mighty God. His power was absolute. His power was comprehensive. They, they needed to think about the commitment they had made in following him. You know what? We need to think about the commitment we've made as well. Jesus' power is absolute. It is comprehensive. He created everything, and because he created everything, he has power over everything, including you and me. He has power over us. And that power that Jesus demonstrated is available to us, not for our own selfish purposes. That power is available to us that we might live according to his purpose. Think about it. The power that brought the world into existence with just a spoken word, the power, Paul said in Colossians 1, that holds the universe together, the power that conquered death, the power that gives life, that same unlimited power is available to every believer so that he can work in and through us as long as we are connected to him. Now think about, when you think about how we are called to live the life that God has made us for, think about how that, how that power could help us. We'd have the power to love the way that he wants us to love. We'd have the power to forgive. We'd have power over fear. We'd have power over addiction. We'd have power to persevere if we're suffering for our faith. We'd have power to bring restoration and reconciliation into relationships. We'd have power to withstand temptation. We'd have power to be cleansed from our sin. We'd have power to have hope in, in trying circumstances. Power to be more like Christ. And that power is available. And it sounds good to have that kind of power, doesn't it? Well, how do you get that kind of power? You get that kind of power when you surrender your life to the mighty God. But you know, there's a problem with that. We want the power, but we also want control. Kind of like the disciples, we're not sure about power that doesn't work according to our own expectations. In fact, in that same chapter in Matthew, in chapter uh, 8, the very next verse after Jesus has calmed the winds and the sea, when he calms the winds and the sea, immediately, Scripture says, they were on the other side, and they were in the country of the Gadarenes. And when they landed on the other side in the country of the Gadarenes, two, violently, uh, two violent demon-possessed men ran out from the tombs there and encountered Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus, of course, immediately took control over those demons. And the demons begged him for permission to go into that herd of pigs that was on the hillside there. And until Jesus said they had permission, they couldn't go. He had complete power over these demonic forces. He gives them permission. They run into that herd of pigs. You remember the story. The pigs run off the cliff and into the sea, and they're drowned. And, and the, the men go back, and they tell what happened. And the whole town comes out. And listen to what it says when the town comes out. They went into the city, told them everything, especially what had happened to the demon. And as those people of the town came out, what did they do? They asked Jesus to, to leave. Think about how the people of this town reacted. They weren't amazed. They weren't happy. They certainly weren't thrilled. They didn't ask Jesus to stay and do any more miracles. They didn't ask Jesus, hey, would you stay and, and, and teach us? They were terrified. Usually when Jesus did miracles, it drew a crowd. There were many people that, that came to him because they, they wanted a miracle. But in this case, they didn't want anything from Jesus. His power terrified them, and so they asked him to leave immediately. You see, they were frightened of the power that Jesus had over demons, and they were afraid of what he might do next. You know, we'd like to think that we would have responded differently, but I think even for us as believers, it probably frightens us when Jesus starts working. And sometimes in our own lives, we ask him to leave. You know, if Jesus, the mighty God, were to say to you, I need to do a work in your life, how would you respond? Would you be able to say, yes, Lord, you're, you're free to do whatever you need to do. I'm ready for you to do a work in my life. Whatever you want with me, I'm, I'm open to that. Or is it more likely that you might say, well, Lord, I, I see that need in my life, but I, I, I've got this. I'll, I'll take care of it. 
Sometimes we're afraid of the power of Jesus. But I want to tell you this morning, if you have invited Jesus to be your Savior and, and the Lord of your life, you don't have a right to say no. It's not about you giving him permission. He doesn't have to ask permission to work in you and, and, and through you. And he may take you places that you didn't want to go. He may make some changes on things in your life that you like just fine. But that's his right. That's what it means that Christ is Lord of a person's life. When you've surrendered to him, he has that right. And, and it might be scary. And it might even be painful, the, the work that he wants to do in you. And sometimes you won't understand what God is doing, but he wants to work his life-changing power in your life. And he wants to make you more and more like Christ. And so the wonderful counselor who gives wisdom in how you should live life is also the mighty God who gives you the power to be able to live the life he's called you to do. Well, this morning we come to that third name in Isaiah 9, 6, and that is Everlasting Father. Now, I'll admit that referring to Jesus as the Everlasting Father could be a little bit confusing. We, we know that Jesus is eternal. We read just a few moments ago in Colossians 1 that he's, a, he's the creator. He's not created. We know that he has always existed. In fact, in John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, John said, in the beginning he was with God, he was God, he is eternal, he's the eternal God, but how is he the Father? How is he the eternal Father? We know there are three persons in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, three persons, yet one God. But listen, Isaiah is not teaching here that God the Son the second person of the Trinity. He's not teaching that he is the same person as God the Father. Remember, these names given in Isaiah are referring to the character of Jesus. So what Isaiah is saying is that Jesus is fatherly or father-like in his treatment of us. And you see that all through his ministry and the way he treated people. You know, we know that Jesus came to die for our sin, but first... Before he died for our sin, he came to live among us. Why? To reveal God to us. Because of Jesus, we know what God is like. Listen to what Jesus said about himself in the Gospel of John. John 10, I and the Father are one. Know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. John 14, he's addressing one of the disciples, Philip, and he says, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? What is Jesus saying? If you want to know what God the Father is like, look at Jesus. Jesus is the perfect image of God. He's the exact representation of God. And Jesus is the one who came to make the Father known. So when Isaiah calls Jesus eternal father, he is telling us that Jesus reflects, Jesus is eternal, and he reflects the father. Now, I don't want to overstate the obvious, but I understand that the mention of the word father produces different reactions in different people. Uh, for some of you this morning, the word father brings a smile. You had a great dad. You had some great childhood memories. You enjoy your time. Your father is, is still here. You enjoy your time with him. Perhaps at the Christmas season, you're excited about the opportunity you're going to have to be with him. For others of you, the word father makes you smile, but it also brings a little bit of, of sadness. You had a great dad, but he's gone on to eternity. You have some great memories, but you also have the memory uh, of his funeral. And so at the Christmas season, there's a bit of emptiness as you realize that, again, there's the absence of your father in the midst of a joyous season. And then for a significant number of us, and I'm including myself, hearing the word father brings up some painful and complicated emotions. For some of us, we would describe our fathers using words like this, distant aloof, absent, passive, unreliable, selfish, uncaring, sometimes even cruel. And so the word father doesn't conjure up some, some warm, fuzzy memories. If you had a father who uh, abandoned you, or maybe a father who was physically present but very distant uh, emotionally or, or disconnected or indifferent, 
you had a father who never expressed pride or never uh, told you of his love for you, or even worse, if you had a father who abused you, Isaiah's description here of eternal father just doesn't do much for you. In fact, it's even a little bit uh, incomprehensible. I'll tell you personally, without question, my lack of relationship with an earthly father has had a tremendous impact on my understanding of God as a heavenly father. You can't help but have your relationship with God impacted by your absent earthly father. Uh, Children learn their first understanding and, and knowledge of God comes through their fathers. The good news is, even though it it has been for me and will continue to be a struggle, as I intentionally move my focus off my earthly father and and dwell about and think about the goodness of God as a heavenly father, I not only have a new perspective on God the Father, but I'm also able to look back on my earthly father with a lot more grace in, in thinking about him and his life. And so my prayer this morning, if you're listening at this point and you're one of those who has suffered significant father wounds, my prayer is that you are finding in God or will find in God all the things that you ever wanted from your relationship with your earthly father. And I think you need to focus on the fact that God loved you so much, he came down into a a broken and sinful world and gave his life for you. Not, Not gave his life for the world, but gave his life for you because he loved you before you even knew and loved him. And that really changes your perspective. Well, before I go back to the text, let me, let me just say a quick word to dads this morning. We all fall, fall short to some degree as fathers. Uh, I can't uh, think of the number of times I had to go back to my kids and ask for forgiveness for wounding them. Even the best dads have some shortcomings and some moments of failure. And if you're thinking this morning, well, I've caused so many wounds in the lives of my children, and even though they're now grown and gone, the relationship is still strained, can I remind you that it is never too late? As long as you have breath in your lungs, and as long as your children have breath in their lungs, it is never too late. And and humility and confession and repentance goes a long way in restoring relationships. Just want to encourage you with that this morning. Well, back to the text of Isaiah 9, 6. His name shall be called Everlasting Father. Everlasting. You know, once you become uh, his child, you belong to him, and he belongs to you forever. Once you become his child, there's no separation, there's no goodbyes, because he is the everlasting father. As Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 38, Nothing, not even death, can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. So to those who place their trust in him, he's the everlasting father. Now, what benefit is there to knowing the everlasting father? I'm going to share with you this morning five characteristics of the perfect father who will never change. He's everlasting. He's unchanging. Five characteristics, and there are many, but five characteristics of God as our Father. Number one, God has no favorites. He loves all his children unconditionally. You know, sometimes I think even believers think, well, that person's more blessed, or that person God has done more in their life. No, God loves all of us unconditionally when we've come to faith in his Son. Think about the words of Peter when he went um, to Cornelius, a Gentile, Uh, Peter had been careful not to interact with Gentiles because the Jews were God's chosen people, and he felt like the Gentiles were not worthy uh, of attention and focus. But God showed him he was to go to this Gentile man, to Cornelius, and to share the gospel with his family. And while Peter was there, he said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So as your father, if you have accepted Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, then you're acceptable, completely acceptable to God. He doesn't play favorites. The second characteristic of an eternal, perfect father is that he is forever faithful. He will never abandon his children. Deuteronomy 31, Moses told the people, it is the Lord who goes before you, He will be with you. Listen, he will not leave or forsake you. Do not fear, be dismayed. 
You know, there's nothing we need to be feared or dismayed of in this life because God will be with us. He will not forsake us. He will never abandon us. The third characteristic of a perfect father is the fact that he's always available. You know, even the best dads, sometimes when kids are growing up, even the best dads are busy. They've got something they need to take care of or some work issue they're dealing with, and they can't be always available. But God the Father is always available. Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, God said these words to Joshua, I will be with you wherever you go. Moses reminded the the Israelites in Deuteronomy 31, the Lord your God goes with you. On the journey in life, he is always with us. He is always available. I love the words of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 33. God says, call to me and I will answer you. So he's available for us. He's available to us all the time. Fourth characteristic of a perfect loving father, he always knows the wise thing to do. This goes back to Jesus being the wonderful counselor. You know, the testimony in in Romans that Paul wrote about God was this. He is the only wise God. He always knows the right thing. He always knows the, the right thing to do. He always has wisdom because wisdom is in God. True wisdom is from God. Finally, the fifth characteristics of a of a loving, eternal, perfect father is this. He's full of compassion. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, the prophet Jeremiah wrote these words. The loving kindnesses of God never cease. His compassions never fail. They're new every morning. I want to leave you with a picture um, today when we think about the compassion of God. It's a very familiar story probably to all of you, and that is of the prodigal son. You see the compassion of God in the prodigal son. You see the availability. You see the forgiveness. You see that he will never be forsaken. You even see the wisdom. This father let his son go, knowing full well what the son was going to do, but he let him go. But then as that son finally recognized that he was in a really bad place, that his father the relationship, being in the home of his father, was the best place he could be. When the son turned and went back, what do we find? The father was waiting for him. The son was going back just to say, hey, just let me be your slave. But the father had such great compassion. He said, absolutely not. You're my son. And he restored him to a place of honor. What an incredible picture of a compassionate father. And this morning, as we think about what God has blessed us with during the Christmas season, I want you to think about the compassion of God, the faithfulness of God, the availability of God, the fact that God will never forsake you. Wherever you are, whatever is happening in your life during this season, the eternal Father is there for you. And Jesus was such an incredible demonstration of the eternal Father. We couldn't understand eternal Father until Jesus came. And as you read through the Gospels and you see how Jesus dealt with people, you see that compassion. You see that faithfulness. You see that availability. And I hope during the Christmas season, even if things are kind of difficult right now, I hope you'll be encouraged to know that God is your eternal Father. He loves you, and he's always there for you. Would you bow with me this morning? Would you take just a moment and reflect on what God's Word has said this morning? Would you think about God being a Father to you? Even if you've not grown up in a home where the word father conjures up warm memories, look at the kind of father that God is. Look at what scripture tells us about the eternal father who is a perfect father. And and turn your focus not on your past and, and maybe wounds from your own father, but turn your focus on God and his nature and who he is. And you may want to just take a moment right now and just thank God for the kind of father he is. You may need to take a moment and ask God to help heal the woundedness in your heart. You may want to take a moment if you're a father and think about your own qualities and characteristics as a father and and how you'd like to be more like Christ as you father your children. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the example you have given. I thank you that you have revealed God to us. I thank you that you are a wonderful counselor. You you have all the counsel that we need to live 
life the way you've called us to. You're a mighty God. You can empower us. We, we can look at how you've called us to live and say, well, that, that's not possible. That's not in me. But you will empower us to live the life you've called us to. And I thank you especially this morning of the reminder that you are an eternal Father, that you love us perfectly and wholly and completely. And I pray for those who need that encouragement this morning, that you would just pour that out on them. Jesus, thank you as we celebrate this season. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being willing to, to leave heaven and come to earth, to die for our sin, but also just to show us what the love of the Father is like. Help us to live in his love and help us to demonstrate his love to those around us. For we ask this in your name. Amen.